Do you remember the case? It involved Officer Darren Wilson from Ferguson, Missouri. The name of the town itself is famous at this point. He killed Michael Brown, but he was found guilty of no crime, cleared of all wrongdoing in the death of Michael Brown by the state and now the federal government as well. But the Federal Justice Department did find what it said was a pattern and practice of discrimination against African Americans by the Ferguson Police Department and municipal courts. Take a look. This week brought fresh news from Ferguson, Missouri, the city which suffered notable civil unrest after Michael Brown was shot down by police officer Darren Wilson. Since the riots, two investigations were launched by the Justice Department. The first looked into the shooting itself, the second into the Ferguson Police Department. On the shooting itself, the finding concluded there was no case against the one individual officer. The investigation concluded that Wilson did not shoot Brown in the back as he was running away, that Brown did stop and turn towards Wilson. Furthermore, claims that Brown had his hands in the air as a sign of surrender were found to be not supported by the physical and forensic evidence. The second report made scathing criticism of the system in which that officer operated laid against the backdrop of a community which is deeply polarized and where exists a deep distrust between the police and the residents. It's not difficult to imagine how a single tragic incident set off the city of Ferguson like a powder keg. Furthermore, the Justice Department on Ferguson's Police Department says that its practices are shaped by the city's focus on revenue rather than public safety needs. The Department of Justice has issued recommendations to the Ferguson Police Department and the Municipal Court on ways to resolve the problems plaguing the community. We are back live on set here at Fresh Outlook. I am joined by the Ebru Think Tank, Jackie Guzda, media analyst from Western Connecticut State University, Joseph Blatler, a police detective, a former police detective, and Dr. Bart Rossi, a psychologist. Joe, you got a dog in this fight because you were a cop. What do you make of the federal report? Well, there's two reports. Actually, the one report exonerates Darren Wilson of the shooting, and then you have the report, which is a complete indictment of the Ferguson Police Department. Um, I actually read the whole report, and first of all, I'm shocked that the police chief is still the chief of police there. Um, there's some serious issues. I mean, first of all, astonishing that the chief of police is in charge of the court system. Uh, basically, they used the Ferguson Police Department to shake down the residents um, through traffic fines, city ordinances, jaywalking. Basically, they turned the police department into a revenue, a source of revenue for the town. That's what it's all about. In these um, small towns, it seems small like town. that's how it is. Uh, my personal opinion, they got to disband the whole police department. Uh, I, what I would do is, I was the mayor, I would disband the police department, and I would have St. Louis County take over police operations. And the good cops from Ferguson, let them get absorbed into St. Louis County Police Department. The bad apples, get rid of them. Same thing with the court. The court has to be abolished. Let their neighboring town take it over. Let them pay Ferguson a percentage of the fines. Because Ferguson has shown they can't, they can't be objective in this matter. Well, you can't, by practicality, have the police chief running the courts because you have two branches that are supposed exactly. to be separate a separation, and different. The Constitution says a separation of power. Exactly. The, the courts is a judiciary branch. The police department is the executive branch. Here, you basically have the police chief running the whole town. It's crazy. I think that's what the Justice Department found and changes will be made. I'm going to turn to Dr. Bart Rossi right now because I heard this and it was an interesting analogy that somebody made. It was a psychologist. They said when you have a white flight community where that all that is left are the white police force, it becomes like a cowboys and Indians mentality that we're the fort, that's them, this is us and we'll do what we want. It's a wild, wild west. It's kind of pervasive. What do you make of that in light of what we've seen in Ferguson and this uh, federal investigation that Joe just described? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. I mean, psychologists talk about goals and achievement, okay? Well, what is the goal and achievement of this department? As Joe's saying, it's to demean the black people. And there's 60% of the, of the folks that are black in this town. So you have a white police force uh, you have three black officers out of 54, I believe, okay? So what is the police chief thinking? He's walking around every day holding court with his officers, and the officers themselves do not in any way represent the community. It's an outrage. It's, it's so far from being fair that, that it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And, and just to say, on behalf of police everywhere, there are so many departments across the country that are 
balance. They look at race. They deal with each other every day. They're individual differences. And they work out pretty well. Not perfectly, but pretty well. This pales in comparison. It's a terrible department. I agree with Joe. Joe actually has specific suggestions here. And I think that's probably the way to go. Jackie, from a media standpoint, this came to light because of an unarmed teenager being shot to death. His race, according to the federal government, had nothing to do with it. His um, race had nothing to do with it, according to a state investigation. And the cop did nothing wrong, according to both the federal and state investigation. Yet this did open up a Pandora's box, if you will, and to look at the entire police department and see what might have unleashed such a fury in response to a crime that might have been tolerated better had it not been in a community where they have suffered through injustices before. Right. Well, this was the silver lining. It opened up all the bad things that were going on. So that's good. And, you know, I really question how many communities in the United States are like this. How many of them have mostly white, you know, uh, majority race cops that are putting down, who are getting their revenues from the citizens, the minority citizens of their community. So, you know, we've got to look at, like Joe said, what the solutions are. Is it community policing? Is it getting to know the cop on the beat? I know that that would, if I was in a community like that, that would be my first choice, was getting to know that cop as a human. Because when we look at what's going on, that cop is not looking at that kid. Like if you take the Tamir Rice case in Cleveland, a 12-year-old boy with a toy gun shot dead within less than two seconds of when the cops saw him. Those cops did not see him. And likewise, when we had the Eric Garner case in New York, and some of those protesters were spitting in the faces of the police, they were hitting the police, I mean, just atrocious behavior. They did not see the cops. Uh, Bratton said that, chief of police here in New York. He said, we do not see each other. And to me, that message is the key to us finally getting along. Jill, let me talk to you about this report from a racial standpoint. Statistically, at least, black people commit more crimes in a greater frequency than white people. Does that lead cops by nature or instinct to perceive black people to be more likely suspect of crimes? I think it depends. I really think it depends. Like, I grew up in a city, so I understood blacks, Hispanics. So when I was a city cop, I wasn't intimidated or fearful of blacks or Hispanics, even today as a private investigator. I have no problem walking the streets of Newark, Patterson. I'm comfortable doing that. But if you take a white kid from the suburbs and all of a sudden you put him into Benson Hertz, it's, it's a different, it's a cultural shock for them. And so they don't know how to react. And if you don't have the proper mentoring and guidance and you have some old time cop who's, you know, doesn't like black people, doesn't like Hispanic people, you know, he starts pushing a young kid in the wrong direction and you have a problem. But going back to the Ferguson thing, the big issue with the Ferguson thing is, I, I really have a problem with is the way they use the people to, to make money. Um, and, and this is a really a, a issue with our criminal justice system. I mean, even Europe, in Europe they have what they call day fines. And your fine is based on how much you make. So for example, if I make $100 a day, say a jaywalking ticket is $100. If I make $100 a day, they will say a jaywalking ticket is 10% of your income. So I pay $10. If I make $1,000, I pay $100. So it's proportionate to people's income. Here, you know, we have people making no money. Mm -hmm. One woman's trying to pay off her, her, her debt to the Ferguson Police Department $100 at a time, and they say, no, we want the whole 600 up front. And also, once the person is hit with a fine like that that they right. can't afford, they're caught up in the criminal justice system. Exactly. They're not paying the fine, a warrant's put out for their arrest, they avoid the warrant, they get pulled over, their license is suspended, you, you it becomes have, a nightmare you, and a downward you, spiral you for their lives. Lore, you have law-abiding citizens in Ferguson being placed in the criminal justice system for not cutting their grass. I mean, this is, this is absurd. Let me turn to Dr. Bart Rossi. Same question I put to Joe before about the instinct to stereotype based on statistics. It's a tough thing for police officers to, to avoid. And as Joe said, if you come from the community, you're more likely to be tolerant of the community. Right. But you see so many cops who are supposed to live in New York City, living in <laughs> Nassau County right. or Suffolk, right. or they're supposed to live in Union City. Instead, they're living in Montclair or wherever it might be. Yes, but I think that if, if a cop has the idea of community policing and he has it correct in his head, 
he's going to behave in a different manner. Sure, th in the city, sometimes blacks will have a higher rate of crime. It happens. But if you understand the community and you deal with your fellow officers and you're going down the right road, you'll probably prevent more crimes. We have a situation in Ferguson where the, the cops are creating crime. I mean, they're, they're creating it. It's, it's hard to believe. And the other thing that I'd like to pick up on is the community itself. I think that there's some blame to go around here. And I think the black community needs to step up. I'm somebody who hap happens to like activists, even if I don't agree with the right. activists. They have a point. Uh, there, there's a point to be made here, a peaceful one, hopefully. And the black community needs to step up. They need to vote. They need to get involved and they need to push things around in, in a reasonable manner so that they can move forward. I mean, three or four cops out, out, of, out of 54? I mean, what, what are the rest of the officers thinking? What is the mayor thinking about, let alone the police chief? I mean, I cannot imagine that the chief goes into work every day and he sees all of these white people, but there's 60% are, are black folks in the community. But it, you know what, it's not only that, it's a black community. I don't think that's the core of the problem. The core of the problem is that this is a low-income community. Right. Because you ask them to step up, which is a great idea. People should be responsible for making their own communities better. However, when you've got two kids, you're a single mother, you're trying to go to college, you're trying to keep your income so low that you still get those SNAP coupons and you can afford to feed your well, kids, you need to you be can't. You need to have rich parents in order to sit in front of Wall Street for Occupy Wall Street, otherwise you couldn't afford to do it. There you I go. Just, there you real go. quickly, I, I just think when it comes to policing, there's three key things. Leadership, supervision, four things, training and hiring. If you have good hiring, good supervision, good training, good leadership, you're going to have a good department. And I think in Ferguson, all four were absent. Sounds like we had a little bit of the old South in Ferguson. Yeah, I would say, mm. you know, I would say that that's true because, you know, three, the second in command of Ferguson just resigned for racial emails, you know. So this is department wide. This is only a 50 man department. So the chief of police cannot say, oh, I had no idea this was going on. No, he knew what was going on. There was a de facto policy in place that this was acceptable behavior, go drive up the tickets, drive up the revenue, and we don't care. We're going to look the other way, do whatever you want. I, I was astonished that they have 600 police reports on backlog that have not been approved yet, that supervisors, if they're charged with um, use of force, do their own investigations against themselves. Where was the chief of police? Well, you know, I, I, see, I see a lot of officers at times, so they thrive on power, and they like to demean certain population of the community. They get off on that and they think that there's something special in, in being abrasive right. and, 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 and arrogant and powerful at the same time. And that's most unfortunate. I think, I think that is most unfortunate, but I, I agree, this is a, a tinge of the old South here. Yeah. The, um, the message for people watching this today, Jackie, is what? Uh, that they can trust the police department, that they can't trust the police department, the hands up that people have been doing at the Grammy Awards, for instance, has been a good thing. Because it's kind of weird because you've got one report that exonerates a cop who was supposedly a killer. Yeah. Or he is a killer, he's just not a murderer or a manslaughterer. Um, and you have another report saying that a lot of people are doing bad things in that town. Yeah, look, people are not all one way or the other. People are a mixture, they're multifaceted. We're not looking at each other as multifaceted. Uh, I don't know how we can cure this in the police department because then we'd have to be the thought police. No, don't look at that black young man with his pants hanging down. He's a honor student, you know. It's, it's really hard to do, and I think we've got to do more research and find out what we can do in uh, people who have these power positions, how we can change the perspective of the people that they are dealing with, even though it's kind of a fight or flight thing. You know, is that kid gonna pull a gun out of his underwear? You know, who knows? I think what we've got to really do is start to truly understand each other. Joe, I think was interesting in New York after the Eric Gardner case, the cops were so angry at the uh, mayor that they turned their back on him. And in fact, they stopped enforcing his quality of life crimes. He's, they stopped writing tra tra uh, traffic tickets as right. frequently, parking tickets as frequently, graffiti offenses. It didn't affect the crime rate at all. And these quality of life crimes that we cracked down on, this broken window theory of policing, really hurts the poor people, like you said, because they get caught up in the system and you know, a $500 fine to me stinks, 
but for somebody else, it's, it's life changing. Yeah. It's like yeah. somebody's car not starting yeah. in the morning. For me, it's a, a inconvenience. I have to call Uber. For somebody else, they're not going to work. They're getting fired. I, I think New York City is, is, as far as like crime has not gone up yet. I think that's to be determined because obviously there's weather factors involved here. It's been a bad winter, so that reduces crime. I think as the summer plays out, we'll see if crime goes up or not. I, I have read reports where shootings are up in New York City, even though homicides are down. But homicides are also very tricky because of the technology and medicine. I mean, 20 years ago, somebody gets shot in the head had no chance of living. Today, you get shot in the head, you, you can survive it. So I think a lot plays into homicide rates these days. But in New York, I mean, even there, I mean, they, they, they put the whole police department under training, sensitivity training. It's a joke and an embarrassment mm -hmm. what they're training these cops to do. They had one guy come in and tell them that if you're facing a hostile situation, close your eyes and take a deep breath. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> you will be out of your mind or lose your mind. I've got to stop you there, Joe, and the rest of the think tank because we're out of time for this segment. Still to come on Fresh Outlook, America's top journalists outed as alleged liars after this.